Sorry, Heather. That was not Heather's fault. She's a great sound woman. Give her a hand. Good job, Heather. Well, hi, guys. That was quite the intro. Now the pressure is even more on. Uh, this night has seemed like it took a long time to get here. I was supposed to go, like, Valentine's Day, and then Tim planned a trip for D.C., and I was like, can I just go the first week? And they're like, uh, go the last week. And I'm like, that's not what I wanted to hear. But it's okay. This is, um, this is going to be awesome. I'm going to be real with you guys because I have to be, because this is not a subject that I feel the most confidence in. So the Lord is really going to help, and that means it's going to be good. And yesterday, funny story, we have a Frenchie named Fitz. If you've seen him, he has his own Instagram, Fitzy the Francie Frenchie. <laughs> I came up with that. Anyway, um, he's kind of derp, if you guys know what that means. He's a little derpy. And he climbs up on tables, chews pencils, chews lab laptops. But yesterday, he spilled water on our table. Got up on the chair, got up on our table, spilled water while we were sleeping. So we're not sure how long my little laptop sat in the water because he chose to waterboard it for information, apparently. So all my notes for like a month and a half, just gone for tonight. And I was just like laying on the couch because I didn't feel good. And I was just like, it's over, just, it's over. I'm not even doing it, I just can't. But I got notes together today once I recovered. Yes, thank you. So yeah, we, we love Fitz. Yeah, he's a good dog, he's, he brings us joy. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to talk. Today we're talking about being single, because I was not a very good single person. And so because I was not a very good single person, I can share you wisdom on how to be a good single person. Yes, thank you. Yes. <laughs> you can be my hype girl. Everybody needs a hype girl. Okay, so let's pray, and then we're going to get into this, and it's going to be good, okay? Okay. All right, Lord, I just thank you so much for this night and this opportunity for you to speak. I just thank you that anything that comes out of my mouth, God, is from you, that it's not me. I just ask you, Father, for hearts that are ready to receive and for fun, and it's not heavy, but it's going to be awesome, and we're going to get something out of this, and we're going to learn, and we're going to apply it to our lives. And I just thank you for every single young man and young woman in here tonight, every adult listening, God, that you have something specific for this season in their life, God, that that um, to mobilize their purpose and that more clarity is going to be um, given to them tonight in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, awesome. Gotta pray. Gotta pray. Okay, so we're talking about being single. I made a title slide and I wanted to explain my title slide. Oh, it's, it looks better without the lights, but I, I put in single in Google <laughs> And it's kind of hilarious just to see what pops up. They're all dating sites. It's like single, and it's like, like there's something wrong with being single. So they're like, here, fix it. Here's all the dating sites. So when I was searching pictures of single, these are the things that popped up. And I was like, yes, it's adventure. It's fun. This guy here kind of looks like Zach with his man bun. I was like, oh, look, it's Zach. And surfing and snowboarding and having fun nights on the beach. This is a good example of what single and life in general looks like. Not single hot ladies in your area call this number, which is what Google wants you to think. So just don't even Google it. It's pointless. I was so disappointed. I was like, I should have known Google. But I just want to talk to you guys on how not to squander the season that you are in. Because when I got married and I looked back, I made the decision to stop squandering my single years, but it was like not that much time before I got married. So I kind of had all these years that I was looking back at and like, were, were they productive? Did they do anything for the kingdom? And I was like, Ugh, not really. Sometimes and sometimes they didn't. It was like I would have good months and I would have bad months or I would have a good stretch of like three months where I was like, I'm a great Christian. And then I have like a week of like, I'm the worst ever. And it was just a roller coaster. And I don't want that for you guys. I'm up here because I love you guys. And I believe that it's not about marriage, which marriage is good, but marriage is not the purpose. You guys were not put on the earth to get married. Does that make sense? Marriage was created to serve your purpose, not the other way around. You were not created to serve marriage. Marriage serves you. And so if you, as a single person, can understand that the goal is to not get married, but the goal is to advance the kingdom, then you're going to have an amazing, productive single life and an amazing, pr productive married life. 
And also, just throwing this out here, some of you may not even get married. It's okay. I know, no one ever hears that, but it really is okay. Just so you guys know, Jesus wasn't married. I'm just saying. Jesus wasn't married, Paul wasn't married. There's a lot of people in history who've done amazing things and lived productive, awesome lives who weren't married. So I don't want you to think that, oh my gosh, I'm this age, I'm not even dating, there's nobody even on the horizon. Have you seen these boys? Believe me, I've been there. I've been looking around like, this is all you got? Seriously? I'm going to another state. And I ended up finding, not finding, but my husband was from Michigan, which, sorry, but hey, Michigan produces some, some good men. David, you got Michigan in your blood, don't you? He's a good man. So anyway, <laughs> right, yes. He's got JC for life on, that's awesome. I really like their posts. The Russells, they, I see you girls, hi. I like your blogs, okay. Anyway, side note. But growing up, I heard all the time about marriage. I heard all the time about relationships and about marriage. But I never really heard about how to live single. How do you live single? All I was being taught, and now listen, I had an amazing youth pastor. Pastor Drenda was my youth pastor. Amazing. And she talked about being proactive no matter what your marital status is. But I never heard all of that because I felt like I was broken because I was single. I felt like single was something that needed to be fixed. Does anybody, has anybody felt that way? That you look in the mirror and you think, I'm single or there's something incomplete in me. My other half is out there. I'm not complete without my other half. And it's just a lie. It's just a lie. And that's what I felt. And on top of that, I had a lot of pride. I had a lot of pride, which is rooted in fear. And fear is rooted in an orphan spirit. And I have great parents. Have you guys know my mom and dad? They're fantastic. Fantastic. I did not have like a bad childhood. So all the mistakes I made were not because I had a rough life physically or like in the natural. It was because I was an orphan spiritually. Even though I was hearing amazing messages from amazing people, I was in church all the time. I think I'm the closest you can get to being a pastor's kid without being a pastor's kid. And there's a lot of those around <laughs> that they're, they pretty much lived and breathed church 24-7. And that's where I was. And surrounding with Surrounded by messages on marriage and messages on courtship, we had a youth pastors who literally, that's what they talked about every single week was courtship. And there were some of us that were like, seriously? Date ship. That's what we like. We're like dating and courting. We tried to like marry the two, so we're like, we're going to do date ship, which is so ridiculous. Aww. But we were just trying to be cool because how many of you know that being a Christian, you stand out? Being a Christian makes you stand out. And there are times when your insecurities, you don't want to stand out. You know, you're like, I'm already weird enough. I'm already homeschooled, okay? I cannot tell you how many times people, you're like a cool homeschooler. I'm like, thanks, you know? But people have, people in the world, they don't understand the way Christians live because their spirits are darkened. They cannot understand. So listen, you're going to stand out. You're going to stick out. You're going to be different. If you look like the world, then there's something wrong, okay? So you can take stock of your life and tell me, or not, you don't have to tell me, but you know, be honest with yourself and see areas where maybe you're afraid to stick out the way a Christian's supposed to. But anyway, so marriage is not the purpose. Marriage serves your purpose. So that's like, we could just lay in the groundwork. Okay, so my views on singleness growing up were skewed. I had a lot of self-hate growing up. Um, I think I was 13 when I first really contemplated suicide. I was sitting on my bed with a pair of scissors, and I just was like, could I do this? But I wasn't brave enough, and I thought if I committed suicide, I'd go straight to hell, and so I was too scared to take my life, but I wanted to because I hated myself. I hated myself. I was full of comparison, full of, there was conflict, a lot of conflict, and that can happen sometimes when you don't know, well, it does happen all the time, when you don't know who you are in Christ. And at 13, I didn't know. At 14, I didn't know. At 15, I was getting more revelation, but it just wasn't important enough for me to, like, pursue. Because sometimes you can have anybody come up on a platform and talk to you, but you are the one who has to have the revelation. And I just wasn't getting a revelation. I didn't really want a revelation. Sometimes you just like being miserable in this weird way. It makes you feel special or something. That's how I, I was like... <laughs> I'm just a wounded soul. 
I'm spe- you know, I'm different, I'm special, I'm, I'm deep. Let me write my poetry, no joke. Deep poetry, pain, and angel's wings that are broken. And I'm not making fun of anybody, but that is where I was mentally. I was not in a good place mentally. And 13 just seems like such a young age to be that messed up. But I feel like things are probably even more escalated in the wrong direction now than they were then. But at 18, I thought I was in love with my best friend. We were best friends for like four years. I had like my little group of girlfriends and we all liked him at some point in our friendship and we all encouraged each other. Whatever, he liked you, go get him. (laughs) But I love him. And that was like, seriously, we are so weird. But at 18, we were like, we both like each other, let's court. And that was courtship. I'm sure you've heard Pastor Tim and Elise talk about it. It really is awesome. Oh, I'm making fun of it, but it's, that's how Claire's being raised when she's 32 and, and ready for all of that. Um, I told my husband I agreed. But <clears throat> so there's something also to be said about having best friends of the opposite gender. It does create a lot of confusion, but that's another thing. We won't talk about that today. So we decided we were going to court. He talked to my dad. I was like all gung-ho about it, even though I was 18 and like literally knew nothing about anything. And so we, 10 days later, the day after Valentine's Day, I broke up, I broke up with him the day after Valentine's Day. It was very sad, but I knew it had to happen. I knew in my heart. Every night I was like having a panic attack, crying. I mean, it was bad. I was like in hiding myself in our back room, just sobbing, texting him. I just, I love you, but I'm not sure I'm in love with you. Does that make sense? I was in such conflict because we had been best friends. I thought this was what love was. I thought this was what love looked like, but it felt so wrong. Like this dreadful feeling in the pit of my stomach. Like it was just wrong and I knew it was just wrong and I just had to break it off with him. And, and it just happened to be the day after Valentine's Day and I felt even more miserable. And if you know us, like Liz, she knows, we've all grown up together. Like I've been here since I was six. So we all were a very close knit group of friends. And when that happened, there was kind of like team Kate, team so-and-so. And I, and even if that wasn't real and it was just in my head, I felt that way. And I remember sitting in the cafe And I was just so depressed. I was disappointed in myself. I felt like a failure. Here I had been hearing about courtship and relationships, and I failed the first time I tried to do it. And I tried to do it correctly, and I failed. And I'm sitting there, and I'm just miserable. And someone comes up to me who was in our friends group and was like, why are you sitting here like this? And I was like, I I just feel so bad. Well, this isn't helping. It's making it worse. And I was like, uh, okay what am I supposed to do with that? And they they walked away. And it was at that point that I realized that there was nobody I could talk to, even though that was a lie. That's how I felt. There's no one I could talk to because everybody knows me. You know what I mean? Have you ever felt that way when you mess up? Everybody knows you and you just feel like you can't talk to anybody because you just feel, uh, I don't know. It was a, it was a very hard place in my life. So at 18, I just was like, Ah, I messed up. I'm, I'm terrible. And at that point in time, I read this on the internet. Someone said if they were a shape, they would be a downward spiral. <laughs> and that is where I was, 18, sitting in that cafe. I just turned into a downward spiral. That's what I am now. And that is what I embraced. Instead of running to God and being like, please help me, heal me, make the situation right, I ran from everything I knew because I felt the shame. I felt the guilt. Every time I saw one of my friends, they hate me because I broke this person's heart. That's where I was, and it was not pretty, and it did not feel good, and I just hated it. And so at that time, I was very vulnerable, and we, I don't know how it happened, but we got connected to uh, an old family friend, and he and I like really hit it off. He was like four years older than me. He was really, really smart, and I at that time was really attracted to intelligence because I felt dumb. Like I felt stupid and I felt all these things. So this smart guy was showing interest in me and I was like, okay, I'm somebody, I'm something. I, I have value because this person thinks I'm valuable. And so we ended up starting to talk, um, on Facebook and then it moved to text. And it was really hard because I was, I didn't have a job. I didn't have my license. I, or I might've had my license. Hmm, Maybe at some point I did in this whole thing, but 
But I like really like this guy. We talked until like three in the morning. If my phone died, I didn't have a normal charger, I would go out to the car and put in, it, put in one of those lighting, lighter chargers and charge my phone and stay up as long as I could, cold, rain, whatever. I was out there talking because he was my like affirmation to life. Like he was why I was living because he was making me feel like I was something. And it ended up being a really, really bad situation. And you know, he was hurting too. It's, it's really hard. You don't want to like say someone's a terrible person because we're all hurting and hurting people hurt people and that's just how it is. And so this guy was hurting just as much as I was hurting and we were trying to find healing in each other and we, we weren't finding healing. We were just finding more brokenness. And so what ended up happening is I started sneaking around, which is so unlike me. <laughs> it's not really. I'm, I'm a little independent. <laughs> but I was like lying. I'd tell my mom that I was working late and she didn't think anything of it, poor sweet woman. She's like, oh, okay, but I, he'd pick me up, we'd go see a movie, we'd go, he'd tell me about his crazy college experiences and alcoholism and his sexual encounters. Really just, guys, what was I thinking? I was not in a good spot. And the whole time this is happening, I'm thinking that I'm having, my relationship with God is great, <laughs> which is so dumb. It's like you wanna go back, I wanna go back and be like, wake up, you know, like shake my shoulders, but um, so it kind of escalated, I was, at that time, my boundaries were really gray, my boundaries were gray, I was, because I was just seeking something, I just, things that were black and white now were just like, well, but I really like this guy, and he likes me, but my one boundary was I, was I would not be his girlfriend. I would not say I was his girlfriend because if I said I was his girlfriend, I would have to come clean, you know, and be like, oh, by the way, everybody, this is my boyfriend. And I didn't want that. So I was just like under the table. He called me his reluctant girlfriend. It's like, you're my reluctant girlfriend. I'm like, no, I'm not your girlfriend at all. We're never getting married. And I knew that I would never marry him. So that tells you where I was mentally. I knew I would never marry him, but I was willing to mess around because of how it made me feel. But I knew it couldn't last, and it ended up being just terrible. A minute, he was verbally abusive, and when you look back, that's when you start seeing things clearly, but you never want to get to a place where you have to look back and see things clearly. You want to be able to see things clearly in the moment, and I was not there. I, my eyes were darkened. My spirit was, I wasn't hearing anything. And so, there was a night where um, I was like daring myself to do things. I was daring myself to cross lines. I'd saved my first kiss. I had thought, I was gonna, I'm gonna wait until I get married. That was the goal. And I was like, Kate, and literally, I'm so psycho. Kate, I dare you to kiss him. And that was it. I, I purposed in my heart that I was daring myself to do this. And before I turned 20, I was going to kiss a guy and I was going to be, stick it to the man and be like, I can, I can do this without your rules. I can do this without your boundaries. This is fine. I don't, I don't need all of that. Because I had resentment towards my church friends and that's trickled into resentment toward my church and that was resentment towards God. And I didn't even realize I was resenting holiness. I just thought that I was sticking it to the man, whoever that man is, whatever. I was just ruining what I had been taught. I was just tearing this great foundation down brick by brick by brick until there was no foundation. And I found myself in a place where I was being verbally abused, where he was making me touch him in places, where things were getting out of control and I was at a place where I was scared. And because my mom had told me She's like, I really think you should stop hanging out with so-and-so, you know, talking to him because, you know, there's, there's history there of, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I, and I was like, whatever, I can handle it. He's fine. He wasn't fine. He was hurting, a very hurting person. And I was scared. He would say things like, I'm going to kidnap you. And he would say things, and he was serious. It was scary. Like, he was going to go away, and I took him to the airport. And this is so melodramatic. I took him to the airport. And I was so relieved that he was getting on the airplane. And so, I don't know if any of you have heard Annie Lennox's um, The Saddest Song I've Got. <laughs> of course not. <sighs> you should Google it, because it's so sad. And I blared The Saddest Song I've Got, held on to the steering wheel, and cried. I was so miserable, so relieved that he was gone, but I knew he was coming back, and I didn't know how to get out of the situation. I felt trapped, because he would tell me things like, 
well, you're not conventionally pretty, but I think you're beautiful. And I would be like, oh, okay. You know, I got manipulated in, into taking pictures and sending him pictures to validate my beauty. Okay, this is this church girl who was raised very well and who let hurt and brokenness fester. And I tried to get the balm of this other person to heal me and it was just creating more wounds. And so finally I fled. And when I say I fled, I literally ran away to Indiana. I told my parents, I'm moving to Indiana. I, I was running from here, this building, this place, these people, because I didn't feel accepted, even though they loved me. I didn't feel accepted. I was running away from him because I was scared. And so I, I moved to Indiana. I was like, this is it. I'm moving to Indiana. I broke it off with him. I, I was, and it felt good, but it felt terrible. I felt empty again. And once again, I was the single girl wasting, wasting my life thinking about how to fix my single state with another relationship. Don't you think I would have learned? <laughs> like, hey, honey, you need Jesus, and you need a lot of Jesus. But I wasn't there. I couldn't see. I couldn't, I just couldn't see. And I don't want that to be you, because being single right now in this season is amazing time for you to focus. Laser beam focus on your purpose. Paul said that... He's like, if you want to marry, that's fine. But there's hindrance that comes with marriage. And that's not necessarily, it's not a bad thing what he's talking about. He's just saying that you have more responsibilities when you're married. You can't just think about you and your purpose and your vision. You have kids, you have bills, you have another person that you're taking care of. It's not just you. So when you're single, you have a very unique opportunity for maybe a short period of time, maybe a long period of time to run hard, to run your race hard. Because now is the only time you have. C.S. Lewis, he says, the present right now is the only thing touching eternity because the past is gone and the future hasn't happened yet. So now is really all you have. So if you're sitting here and you're a girl and you're thinking, my life won't start until I get married and, and then I can pursue my calling, you're missing it. You are missing it. If you're a guy and you think that you have to be ruled by these uh, drives and these emotions and all these things, you're missing it too. You don't have to be driven by anything but the Holy Spirit. Because when you got saved, you submitted everything under God. That includes your sex drive. Just throwing that out there. That includes your sex drive. And that goes for both guys and girls, but I know guys, we tend to talk about it more, but what else? You, right now, today, are young men and young women. The Bible never, ever, ever, ever will you read teenager in the Bible. That is a man-made word to make you feel isolated. Okay? There's either child there is young adult, and then there's an adult. And guess what? Age has nothing to do with it. I know plenty of adults who are not mature spiritually or not mature emotionally. They still are growing. You make the decision. You do. When am I ready? I hope that's now because now is all you have. Now is all you have. You don't buy into the lie that your teenage years have to be full of mistakes, that your teenage years have to be full of rebellion and experimenting and blah, blah, blah. That's a lie from the pit of hell. It's a lie. You don't have to spend your teenage years in rebellion. Why would you want to, especially as a Christian? If you believe that Christianity makes you look different in every area, that means your teenage years better look different than the world's teenage years. Right? Yes. Yes, and I want you guys to get this. So it took, oh, my hype girl, mm, I love you. Oh, she's so cute. <laughs> anyway, um, in the beginning of the video before worship, the, my hype video, the reason I, I wanted that to be a precursor is because I wanted to put into your brain a picture of what your life is supposed to be. Your life is supposed to be advancing the kingdom in, in zeal and zealousness. I don't know if that's a word, but it is now. And the scripture, someone said it is, thank you. The scripture in the beginning says, Lord, I have heard your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds. Repeat them again in our day. How does he do that? How can God repeat what he did in that day, in this day? How does he do it? 
us, you, sons and daughters of God. He needs you. And he's not waiting for you to get married. He's not waiting for you to get in a relationship. He's just waiting for you to realize who you are in him and go after it. How much time do I have? When is this over? Keep going? Oh, okay. <laughs> I just, I want to be respectful. <clears throat> um, when I lived in Indiana, that is when it was pretty bad. Um, I, after this guy that was scary, I was trying to find healing again. So my friends and I all were like, oh my gosh, you know what would be really funny? Is if we all get eHarmonies. You know? Secretly we're all like, oh gosh, I hope we find someone. We're getting old. We're like 21. So we, we get eHarmonies. I meet a guy from New York who's super rich who decides to fly from New York to come meet me. <laughs> no big deal, I'm important. People fly out of state to come talk to me. <laughs> I'm just kidding, that's how I felt though. I was like, wow, he's willing to, to fly all the way from New York to come meet me? Wow, and he was helping me through the path of this other relationship. I was still this broken, baggage-ridden chick. Why would any guy want to take, I don't know, but he was like trying to help me. He was a sweet Christian guy trying to help. <laughs> you know, he liked me. I was pretty. I was fun. On the inside, I was like crying all the time watching Mythbusters and eating Dr. Pepper and personal pan pizzas. But he thought I was great because, man, I could really put on a show. <laughs> oh, the bachelor at, at days, yes. Anyway, so he flew in. And at that point, I was really trying to get it together because that last relationship scarred me. And I was like, Lord, I, I don't want that to happen again. I was trying to get it together. So I was like, I'm setting my boundaries. We are not kissing. My next, the next time I kiss will be the man I marry. And I was firm. So he came and I told him, I was like, listen, we're not going to kiss. He's like, oh, okay, okay. So he, he, you know, we hang out, and my family came up because I was trying to do things right. I was trying to get back to the old ways. I was trying to get back to courtship. I was trying to get back to my family being involved. So my brother, you're not Ben. He's somewhere. Ben came up, and um, Amanda, and I don't know. They all came up, and it made me feel good that they were there. But what happened next is just me being weak. So... We decided to go to a movie, and he was going to drive me so we could have alone time, so we could talk. And I told him before we got in the car, we are not kissing. Because I really purposed in my heart that the next man I kissed was going to be my husband. And so we get in the car, and he pulls off into this parking lot. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> what's happening? I was like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm just really tired. Okay. I was like, I told him. I was proud of myself. It's like, if you do not get out of this parking lot, and go to the movie theater. I will get out and walk. And so he, he did. He, he did. He, he moved out of the parking lot. I was like, yeah, yeah. Pulled into another parking lot. And I was like, and I started to feel scared. Now I felt scared, because I was alone with a man I didn't really know. I met online, and I have heard of the Craigslist killer. And I'm like, oh, Lord Jesus. I'm not seeing this movie tonight, am I? <laughs> I'm going to heaven. So... I'm making light of it, but that's, that stuff happens, and, you know, sorry. <clears throat> so we pull in this pregnant line, and he lays out on my lap, and I'm just like, seriously, this is how I felt. So I was like, okay, I got to get out of this situation. I got to get out of this situation. What do I do? And I just knew what I needed to do, even though that's not what I needed to do. I needed to get out of the car, and I needed to call Ben. But I felt trapped once more because I needed the affirmation of this man to make me feel like I had value. And so I'm like, I just like touched his head. I was like, okay, oh my gosh. <laughs> and I was like, he's not, I just knew he was not gonna leave until I kissed him. So I did, I was like, whoop de woo yay. Worst kiss of my life. I've never had a good experience with a kiss until Tim. I was like, this is bluff, this is kissing and I just can do without it. And so then he suddenly was, wide awake and we went to the movie theater. After the movie was over, I looked at Ben and Amanda, I was like, you guys are riding with me. You're riding in my car because I'm not gonna get stuck in another parking lot because who knows what's gonna happen then. The day after he left, he called, I was like, no. This is, we're over. I was heartbroken. I was heartbroken. I 
I just don't want these things to happen to you guys because it's all just rooted in fear. And it's rooted in lies. And I was heartbroken because I had failed again. And he was a Christian. He was a Christian. The guy before that, he wasn't a Christian. He wasn't saved. He didn't know God. This guy did. He had prayed for me. I was wounded. I, I did not know. I was like, where do I go from here? Every relationship that I'm in fails. But I'm single and I have to fix this. So after that, I would go on dates with guys. It never went more than two dates because I just, I would feel my spirit because I was really trying to get back into a close relationship with God. So I would have two dates and and I'd pretty much feel like, eh, no. One time my parents were like, this guy drove up from Tennessee, whatever, to come visit me and he talked to my parents and he did not believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that was like a boundary for me. I was like, no. And he talked to my parents and my, my mom and dad were like, yeah, no. He wants to take you to Canada and start a church. No, which I didn't even remember that. So mom told me the other day. I was like, he did? What the heck was I thinking? I would never want to live in Canada. Canada's beautiful. Anyway. <laughs> Psalms 119.9. How can a young person keep their way pure? And that doesn't just mean in relationships. That means in every area. By guarding their way according to your word. Another scriptures in James, true religion is taking care of the widows and the orphans. And then it goes on to say, and keeping yourself from the pollution of the world. How do you guard your way according to the word? You put boundaries in your life. And you need to put boundaries in your life as a single person to prepare you for a real God-ordained relationship. You're busy trying to fix being single with unordained godly God relationships and you're just setting yourself back spiritually and emotionally and you're just bringing more baggage into the next relationship into the next relationship you guess what don't have to make mistakes in your relationships I know that sounds crazy but if you're spirit led you can do this right you can do this righteously and you can keep your way pure but you need to set boundaries and you need to back them up with the word of God they can't just be loosey-goosey I'm just not gonna kiss until marriage why not hold up back it up with the word because that is what's going to keep you is the word of God and it's not trapping you do you guys know the uh, the hand stop signs on crosswalks do you ever get mad at them I can't believe it I can't believe it's not letting me cross the road right now like I just want to go get coffee do you ever get mad at the stop hand no that'd be ridiculous Because the stop hand's warning you that, hey, if you cross the road, you might get hit by a car, Regina George style, and die. Only she doesn't die, which it's a terrible movie. (laughs) Lord, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that reference. Anyway, that is what boundaries are. Boundaries are the stop sign on a crosswalk. And you need to back that boundary up with the word of God. Otherwise, you're going to compromise. I've been in every weird circumstance in a relationship with boundaries. I've been in a relationship where I was like, yes, boundaries, because I was, I was really in my relationship with God and everything was good. And I knew who I was. I've been in, I kind of have boundaries, but I'm willing to compromise. I've been in the, there are no boundaries, free for all, and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. When I met Tim, I had just... <laughs> I had been doing well. It had been five years since I went on a date. I was really pursuing my relationship, but now I was getting old in the church world. If you're not married at 18, you're an old maid, which is ridiculous, by the way. I was 26 when I got married, and people think that's old. Gosh, ugh, ugh. Listen, it's not old. But see, that's what happens when people... I don't want to say anything, but that is what happens when we emphasize that marriage like it's the goal. When, when we need to emphasize to you at this age that there's purpose in your life right now. Okay? There is. There's purpose in your life right now. But anyway, um, so I was like, I should go out with this guy. He's really nice. There's no reason why I shouldn't. So I did. I went out with this guy, and I knew right away it wasn't right. But I had a friend who was like, well, it's been five years. Give it a shot. You're just not used to the dating pool again. And I was like, maybe. I don't know. Okay. So um, I ended up like 
no, this is so wrong. He wanted me to meet his parents, and I just called. He's the nicest guy ever. I just called him, and I was like, listen, I, I don't want to meet your parents because I know that we're not going to get married. And he's like, okay. So we, it was fine. And we're still friends. The next month is when I met Tim. And it was actually that mission trip. Tim's my husband, by the way, for those of you who don't know. And it was actually that mission trip where I really found freedom. And, like, from myself. And from a baggage that I didn't realize I still carried. And so this, guys, was like a five plus year process and those were my single years. Those were single years that I could have been using to, for a lot. I love to write, I could have been writing, but I was, too, I was too wrapped up in insecurities to think my writing was any good, you know? I could have been doing so much with so many passions, but I was locked in insecurities and I felt like I couldn't do anything because I was single. I felt like my destiny had to wait to attach itself to a to my husband so that we could chase our destinies together instead of just pursuing my destiny and letting him come along when the time came and not worrying about it. So I'm gonna close, but <clears throat> I wanna encourage you guys. You have an opportunity. You have an opportunity and it's huge and it's beautiful. And that is to live these single years for however long they are and who cares how long that is. I don't care if you're 50 and not married, whatever. It's not about your age. It's not about societies, go to school, graduate, get married, have kids, work a job, retire. No. In the kingdom, it's so different. In the kingdom, it's so different. You're never going to retire in the kingdom because you're going to have too much fun advancing it. Okay? Listen. Spiritually, you can either go forward or backward. Okay? So you need to ask yourself, am I advancing? Or like me, are you living on past glories and really you're doing this? You know? So the key is to know who you are in Christ. And that's what I'm closing with. The key to thriving in this season is to know what it means to be a son and a daughter of God. Because if you know your identity, then anything that comes against your identity, you're going to be like, uh uh. No, I know who I am. I know who I am. If you have insecurities now, a relationship will not fix them, a relationship will just make them worse. I'm hearing nods from married ladies, they know. Okay? Girls, you do not need a man or a guy or whatever to, to complete you. You are complete. When you come to Christ, you're a complete creature. You are complete. It's like when you get an iPhone and it's perfect and it's brand new and it's awesome and it works and it's an iPhone. It's the X and it has the emojis and it's wonderful. Marriage is a desire and a call that some are called to and some are not called to. And when you get an iPhone, it's perfect, right? You don't think it's not an iPhone because it doesn't have a case, right? You are an iPhone. And maybe you want a new app and it's not on there yet. But one day you're going to download it. Whatever. You are perfect. That's a terrible analogy. You're so much better than an iPhone. <laughs> but that's all I could come up with on the fly. So what we're going to do right now is there is an amazing audio called Father's Love Letter. And that is what I, I want us to listen to this. It's only about five minutes long. But it is God speaking to you who you are, affirming who you are. And that is what I needed. That is what I needed. Even though I had every outlet to go find it, I couldn't hear, I couldn't see because I was trying to fix myself. Right now, just let your brain stop running. Let it stop running. Don't be thinking about a mistake you made. Don't be thinking about, oh, but I'm kind of in a relationship. Should I break up with him? Just don't. Just don't even go anywhere like that. Just for a second, we're going to listen to this audio. I'm going to pray for you in, at the end, and, and at the end, we're going to have an altar call. Because maybe there's some things in your life that are holding you back from being a son or a daughter. It could be an insecurity. It could be pornography. It could be self-harm. It could be same-sex attraction. It could be anything. Okay? But we're going to open up the altar, and we want to pray with you. If you don't feel comfortable coming to the altar, there are tons of amazing adult leaders here that would love to talk and pray with you. But let's go ahead, Heather, and let's... Put the lights down and close your eyes and just start listening to this audio and let the Holy Spirit speak directly to you. This is not an, just a blanket audio. Make it personal. Make it personal. God is speaking to you. Go ahead and play it. The words you are about to experience are true. 
They will change your life if you let them. For they come from the very heart of God. He loves you. And He is the Father you have been looking for all your life. This is His love letter. My child, you may not know me, but I know everything about you. I know when you sit down and when you rise up. I am familiar with all your ways. Even the very hairs on your head are numbered, for you were made in my image. In me you live and move and have your being. For you were my offspring. I knew you even before you were conceived. I chose you when I planned creation. You were not a mistake. For all your days are written in my book. I determined the exact time of your birth and where you would live. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. I knit you together in your mother's womb and brought you forth on the day you were born. I have been misrepresented by those who don't know me. I am not distant and angry, but am the complete expression of love. And it is my desire to lavish my love on you, simply because you are my child and I am your father. I offer you more than your earthly father ever could, for I am the perfect father. Every good gift that you receive comes from my hand, for I am your provider and I meet all your needs. My plan for your future has always been filled with hope, because I love you with an everlasting love. My thoughts toward you are countless as the sand on the seashore, and I rejoice over you with singing. I will never stop doing good to you, for you are my treasured possession. I desire to establish you with all my heart and all my soul, and I want to show you great and marvelous things. If you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. Delight in me and I will give you the desires of your heart. For it is I who gave you those desires. I am able to do more for you than you could possibly imagine. For I am your greatest encourager. I am also the Father who comforts you in all your troubles. When you are broken hearted, I am close to you. As a shepherd carries a lamb, I have carried you close to my heart. One day, I will wipe away every tear from your eyes, and I'll take away all the pain you have suffered on this earth. I am your Father, and I love you even as I love my Son Jesus. For in Jesus, my love for you is revealed. He is the exact representation of my being. He came to demonstrate that I am for you, not against you, and to tell you that I am not counting your sins. Jesus died so that you and I could be reconciled. His death was the ultimate expression of my love for you. I gave up everything I loved that I might gain your love. If you receive the gift of my son Jesus, you receive me. Nothing will ever separate you from my love again. Come home and I'll throw the biggest party heaven has ever seen. I have always been father and will always be father. My question is, will you be my child? I am waiting for you.
sometimes the hardest things, we just have to take it back to the most simple thing, and that is that we are sons and daughters of God, and that's where we start from. So let's just pray. God, I just thank you so much for the, every son and daughter in this auditorium. I thank you, Father, that you have purposed in their hearts something great. I thank you for the desires that you have put in their hearts. Desires for beautiful relationships, desires for a beautiful marriage, desires for a beautiful life. And we just thank you right now, God, that you show them that they have the grace and the spirit inside of them, the empowerment to live this life without making mistakes. That they can live their single years without picking up emotional baggage. That they can change the landscape of their lives by the Spirit. We thank you that they are conquerors, that whatever they're facing in their life today, God, that you have made them conquerors, that you have displayed their life like a victory parade so that others can be drawn to the gospel. We thank you for the example of Jesus, who even though he had no sin, related to everybody. And I thank you that you use the bad and you use the good to reach people because you love us and you love them. And so I just speak life to each and every person tonight. I speak, uh, I speak zeal, God, that they would have fire, like your scripture says, fire shut up in their bones that has to come out. And I just thank you, Father, that you mobilize them, that they become a group of teenagers that the world would wonder why are they different. And I thank you that they're not defined by their temptations. That their identity is in you, God. And so I, for those who are beating themselves up right now in guilt and condemnation because of temptations, I just bind that spirit of, of condemnation right now in the name of Jesus. Jesus, you were tempted with everything. Every gross sin no one wants to talk about, you were tempted with. Everything that they are facing, you, you were tempted with and you had the power by the Holy Spirit to say no to. And so we release that to them right now in the name of Jesus. We release your spirit that says no to the devil, that seeks to entrap them. They are not trapped, but that your righteous road is freedom. I thank you for their future spouses if indeed they get married, which I'm sure most of you will. We thank you for their future spouses, protect them and keep them safe, that they don't spend one day in the enemy's camp. I thank you that these here don't have to spend one day in the enemy's camp, God. I thank you that they set up holy boundaries to keep their hearts safe. In the name of Jesus, if you have anything that you want prayer for, even if you're not going through something and you just need a hug of encouragement, please come up after the service, after we dismiss. I know you guys want to go have fun and hang out with your friends, but if seriously, if you need prayer for anything, if there's something that you have been doing on your own because you are ashamed to come and talk to someone, come and talk to someone. And we just thank you, God. We thank you for joy. We thank you for happiness. We thank you that these single years are going to be the best ever and that they are going to show and have an example of what it looks like to be a Christian young adult. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you, guys. Hey, guys, Kate and Claire. Say hi, Claire. This is her first YouTube video outside the room. Can you smile? No, okay. Well, um, today's video was a little different. I had the opportunity to speak at my local youth group, XM. I grew up there, actually, so it was really, really cool. So I just wanted to say thanks for watching. I know it was kind of long and different, but I wanted to put the information for XM below. So if anybody's in the area and you want to come to a really great youth group, you can come visit XM. So thanks for watching and we'll see you next week or sometime. Say bye. She doesn't talk yet.